Okay, recording is on. Welcome everyone back to BC 212, our second lecture on Christian apologetics. So we are looking at this scenario where the baker or the, or the owner of the bakery uh, is, 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 is in this dilemma. Uh, a gay couple has asked him to make a cake for the wedding. And he has three options. I mean, I'm, we're just thinking, right? Um, he could have thought that, well, this is purely a commercial transaction. I don't care what you do with the cake. I'll make a cake, whatever you want to order. Uh, I'll write on it, write on the cake, whatever you want. It's your cake. I'm making it for you. You pay me, pay me the money. Job is done. Or he could have looked at it as, I don't agree with the gay marriage, but I love the people. I, I love to serve. I'll make a cake for you. I'll write on it whatever you want. And uh, that's it. I'm just doing it out of love. I, but I don't agree with uh, the gay ma marriage. Or third, third option, third thought process would be, I don't agree with it. I love you. But I can't get myself to make this cake for you, for your wedding, because uh, I just don't agree with the whole, the gay marriage. I don't agree with it. So I won't do it. Um, and it's not an easy, it's not an easy decision, right? Because there is your faith involved, there is business involved, people involved. It's not an easy decision. Faith uh, in the truth of God's word. I know what God's word says, but I have to run a business. I have to make money. And on the other side, there are people. People have to be treated fairly, respectfully, and uh, you know, as a baker, I'm not, or, or as a bakery, we are not deciding on people's personal matters. That has we have nothing to do with that. We only make cakes and give cakes for people to eat. That's it. So all these questions. Now, what we have outlined. Uh, just go back to our PDF as a framework. So we we're trying to use this framework. Okay. How, how, how do we arrive at a decision right, on this? So I'm going to just go through the framework, try to see if we can apply it, and then I want to hear your thoughts. So first is we cannot override human will. That means as a, as a bakery owner, I am not going, I don't have the right to tell those two people, you, you, you can't get married. We can't. We can't control that. That's their choice. We can express what's right and wrong and encourage them to choose right. right. Now, uh, this is a bakery. This is not a church or this is not a, you know, a moral center or anything. It's a bakery. We make cakes and we sell. So I have to be careful as a, as a, as a bakery owner. I'm not here to be a moral police on people. I'm only here to make cakes and give to people. But now here's this little touchy situation where a moral issue has come connected to a cake, which is a gay couple is going to get married. The question is, is this the right place for me to express this opinion or express what I believe? Because they came to buy a cake. You know, and this is not a church. This is not a, uh, you know, where people come to learn morality or even ask questions where they come to buy cakes so is this the right platform for me to express my personal belief so that's a very you know a, a very tricky question and do i need to get into a a, a a reasoning on this you know is this the right time and place and platform to engage in conversation and discussion on this that's a question. And if I were to express what I believe is right and wrong, 
I still can't force it on them. Uh, I may be, you know, I should be willing to listen to what they have to say. Now, as God, my father, I must treat everyone with love and fairness. So here's a couple. I don't agree with what they are doing. I don't. Uh, I mean, here's two two men. I don't agree with what they are doing. Uh, I have to treat them with love and fairness, as I was, as I said, I would treat any other customer. That means if I make a cake, I have to make the best cake I can for them. I have to do it the way they are wanted it. You know, whatever they ask for, whatever they are paying for, I have to treat them fairly. But yeah. Number five becomes a problem, not a problem, but the challenge. I cannot compromise myself. That means there is certain truth I believe, and the truth is I don't. I don't accept the gay marriage. I don't. I don't believe that's right. And I believe you have to be holy before God. And I. I and so I'm balancing truth and love, truth or holiness and love. So that. Number five becomes the challenge. I must not compromise myself. God doesn't compromise himself. I mustn't compromise myself. Right? So this is a framework. So you're thinking through. You know, I have three options in front of me. This is a framework. What would be a decision I can make in this situation? I just want to listen to your thoughts here. Uh, I know there are two uh, additional questions that um, there are good questions that are put up on the chat. Rosalind and Elisha, we'll, we'll get to it. But let's try to uh, think through on this bakery uh, question that was uh, raised up earlier. Uh, the question the question is, you know, in, 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 in an attempt to express love, is it okay to make the cake and uh, give it, or would it be looked upon, uh, you know, as not showing love to these people? What are your thoughts? How What would be... A decision you would want to make. Okay, so I see one one response. You know that uh, Rosalind shares that. Um, uh, the baker, the owner of the bakery, could have shared God's word to show his position that you know that that he believes what God's word that it's against homosexuality and he cannot go against it. Uh, so that's that reasoning part. You know, we are we are we're expressing what's right and wrong. We are reasoning together, and at the same time, we're showing love, uh, like he can offer them free pastry uh, and say, "Look, I can give." You know, I can give this to you as an expression of love. So that's an interesting thought. I mean, what if the speaker said, "Hey, guys, you know what? Uh, I, 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 uh, I don't. You know, I personally, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I, I don't. Um, and this might be kind of, you know, just imagine if the baker had done this, right? He told these two guys, and guys, I don't. Uh, you know, I don't. I'm a Christian, and you know, my faith teaches me that." Uh, Marriage was meant for a man and a woman, uh, and so it really goes against my faith. But you know, uh, uh, I'm happy to offer you a free cake or something. You know, what if he had done that? That means he has he has expressed his position, and at the same time, he's offering something for free. So he's also expressing love to them, but he's also expressed his position. You know, so that's that's an interesting thought. Uh, he could have done that. Anyone else? Okay. All right. So um, you know, so I, I thought. Of, see, so when I think about this whole situation. And I think, I think where this the baker and, and myself included, if I was in that place, I was a big, I was the owner of that bakery. The thing that I would have struggled with is, you see, I love the people, but it's going against my own conscience. It's going against. It's like I'm compromising myself by 
offering something that actually supports or it's going into something that I don't believe in, I don't stand for. That's where I would have struggled myself, you know, if I was the owner of the bakery. Like, okay, I love the people. I know I cannot dictate their thoughts and their choices. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I, uh, that's their personal choice. I love them. I want to serve them. But I don't. I, I can't get myself to support a gay marriage. So that's where I would have struggled, and you know, I would have had to. Now I don't know exactly how the interactions all happened, you know, but if I was the baker there, I'd try to say, hey, you know, I I, I really love to serve you guys. Uh, I would, you know, but. I don't, you know, personally, because of my faith, I don't believe in, the, you know, a, a gay marriage. I don't believe marriage was designed by God for that. And, uh, you know, you'll have to excuse us or excuse us as a bakery from making a cake for this marriage, for your marriage. Okay. So that's kind of where. Uh, and, and that, you know, to do that lovingly, to do that politely, uh, I would have tried to do, you know, express it in loving, in a loving way, in a polite way, and uh, try to take that stand. Why? Because of that, you know, I, I cannot compromise myself. I cannot compromise on what I believe. In this in this particular situation, and because you're the owner, you're in charge of this. You do have a right to the decisions you make as how you want to function. To that extent, yeah, you have a right. You're not uh, violating some. You're not violating their rights. They can always go and get a cake from somewhere else. You're not violating their rights. You're not enforcing your views on them. You're only expressing it in love, and at the same time, you're not. You know, you're you're willing to. You're not willing to compromise yourself, so so that has to be done in love. Now, the, the whole issue is: Could I have made a cake for them in love? And the answer is yes. And I, if I was willing to tell them, say, you know, uh, hey, uh, in, in in my thought process, if I could have said, yeah, I don't agree with that, but. You know, they are people, they're going to eat the cake. Anyway, they're going to go and get married. Nobody can stop them from doing that. And anyway, they're going to get a cake from some other shop. So, okay, I'll just make it and give it to them and let it go. Maybe I can express and say, hey, uh, I don't believe in a gay marriage, but hey, God loves you guys. And I uh, you know. I, maybe I could, but that's left to the individual, you know, a person, the the baker, the owner of the bakery. If he is able to bring himself to do that, okay. But for me personally, I, I wouldn't be able to com you know compromise myself in the sense that I, this is against my conviction. It's against what I believe, and so lovingly I will express and lovingly I will decline taking up the. Uh, order. Another believer may have chose to handle it differently. He may have said, "Okay, I don't agree with it, but you know, uh, God loves these people. They're going to go get married anyway. They are going to go get a cake from anywhere else. So you know, you can't stop them. So I will let them know where I stand, and I'll just make the best cake I can give and give it to them." Some other believer may have made that choice. That is, you know, I won't. We won't judge that person. It's fine. Or a third believer may have made a purely commercial decision. Says, "Hey, I'm just making cakes and selling. What they want is up to them." And again, we won't judge that believer as well. So, you know, a believer has these three options. Uh, each individual may be fully convinced to take one of these options, and you know, we don't judge them. Okay, as a believer, you made that choice, but the, we need to understand the thought process behind it, and it's okay, you know, their conscience is before God and they're making their decision based on, you know, with, given the framework, they're, they're arriving at a, 
conclusion that keeps them that way, you know, gives them a conscience that way, and that's, that's fine. So I hope I answer. I mean, hope we help think through that question, not the. I, I mean, it's not that we have to have a certain answer, but right. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Very yeah. helpful. Okay. Thank you. Now let's uh, take up uh, Rosalind's question here. So the question here again, a very interesting scenario, is let's say there's a, a believer. They have a street eatery. Okay, that means they have this mobile eatery on, or that could be put up anywhere on the street. And, you know, so the police comes and says, hey, you can't park here, you can't put up your stall here uh, unless you give us some money, otherwise you'll have to move. The question is, should the couple pay or not? So here's my quick response to that. See, well, police or no police, uh, as a believer, you know, we have to do what's permitted by law so if the law permits me to have a stall on the roadside in that place where in a certain places you can certain places you cannot so if it's a place where I should not put up a stall the main reason you know of course is for the obst obstruction the flow of traffic that's the reason why in certain parts of the city they say you cannot put up a stall here but as in other parts of the city you're free to you know have these mobile trucks and whatever and Nobody bothers. So if I'm in a place in a city where I'm putting up a stall, a food stall, a mobile food stall, and it's not permitted by law, then the police is a non-issue. I am violating the law, and I shouldn't be putting it up there in the first place as a believer. So that would be my first response. Hey, are you allowed to put up a stall, you know, a stall there on in that part of the city? If you're not allowed to, then you have no business doing it there. So go to a place where you're permitted to have a mobile food stall on the roadside. And some streets you're allowed to do that, you know, where because whatever, there's a lot of people, there's there's a lot of space and you're you're allowed to have a mobile food stall. You can get permission from the police. And we've done that. We've done that. We've got police permission to put up stalls. Uh, for when we want to give out tracks and all that. So we go to the police, they give us a stamp, say, yeah, you're allowed to. So we put up a stall and we give out tracks, we give out free books. So we can do that. So we get prior permission. We don't have to pay anything. Yeah. Um, but if I'm doing something illegal, that is I'm putting up a stall in a place where I should not put up a stall, and then I'm paying the police, then I'm doing double wrong. I'm doing two wrongs. One is, I'm breaking the law, I'm breaking the rule. Second is, I'm paying off the people who are supposed to enforce the rule. So I end up doing two wrongs. So my advice to this couple would be very simple. Hey, put up your stall on a street where you have permission. Go get police permission. You, you know, usually you have a letter saying we are having the stall on this link. And they give you a stamp permit. Nobody's going to trouble you. Uh, so that would be my response in that situation. Okay. Um, uh, now, another question here from Elisha. Uh, a Christian couple is confused about a decision whether to go ahead and process their permanent immigration visa to the United States. The wife thinks the opportunity was a result of the husband engaging in a lottery, so she won part of the she won't be part of it. The question is, is it wrong for a Christian to be engaged in lottery? So, you see, the, the lottery process in an immigration is different from a lottery where people have to engage in some form of gambling. These are two different things, right? The lottery process for a visa is is is, you know, you can call it a, a legal process, meaning um, they call it a lottery because they're just trying to be fair to everybody. They're saying it's a blind process, meaning uh, we are not giving any preference to any individual. We are going to receive all the applications that come in, and then there's going to be a random selection of, you know, so many numbers of visa that we are going to give out, award. So that is not an illegal process. It's not an illegal thing. It's just um, 
a way of fairness to all the applicants. So there is nothing wrong about that. So especially if you're talking about an, a country's immigration process, most of them do it like that. Why? They want to be fair to everybody. All who want to apply, please apply. But then in the end, the selection is going to happen at a, you know, at a random, equal, equally fair process. That's a lottery process. And there's nothing wrong in that. It's it's a legal way of doing things. It's just the government trying to be fair to all the applicants. The lottery thing that's wrong is where things might be a gambling thing. Uh, now, the government runs lotteries, <laughs> which means it's, again, a legal thing. You know, the government uh, invites people to buy tickets, and they say, OK, you now we want to give out or award uh, whatever amount of money uh, and uh, as an award to people, you know, and you buy a ticket and think, OK. So that's, again, a, it's a legal thing. It's the government doing it as a way to benefit people uh, in their own area or region or whether it's a state or a whatever. Usually it's run by the state government, at least here in India, that's what I'm aware of. Uh, uh, it's a state government run thing. They want to give some benefits to people in their own state. So they have certain awards and they run these things. They invite people in the state to buy those tickets. Again, it's a legal thing. It's not an illegal thing. So. I don't find anything wrong with that. It's the government doing something as a way of trying to benefit their uh, citizens, but they want to do it in a very fair way. And so then they do this lottery system where there is no bias towards anybody. Everybody has an equal chance to win it. That's why they do the lottery. But I think where things can go wrong is in the gambling process where, um, and again, I don't know too much about it, but uh, you know, if you in a gambling process in a non-regulated uh, environment, uh, you know, in some of these gaming centers, or whatever, you know, you keep buying tickets, you keep spending money. People gamble; they put in a lot of money, they spend a lot of their money, hoping that you know you buy these tickets and you might get a lot of money and so on i think that when it it's a, it's a, it's an unregulated process it's a more of a gambling process uh, in the form of a lottery i think that would be something a christian should avoid because that becomes addictive it's a waste of money uh, it's yeah i don't know i don't know all the details how it works but it's unregulated it's and sometimes maybe even illegal so we need to avoid but Visa, awards from the government, these are government-regulated way to be fair to everybody, and those are fine. Okay. All right, let's take up. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I think I, I largely share with you similar thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Elisha. All right. My last question here from Rosalind was: Is a is a, a member of a as a member of a residence society um, during Hindu festivals, and they come for contributions towards the celebration? Must I contribute or refuse? What would be the right thing to do? Okay. A quick answer to that is: You know, I I generally refuse um, because one is there is no compulsion to give, and secondly, you give because you believe in what you're giving towards. And since we don't believe in uh, whatever that you know celebration is, uh, we don't give, and and there's no compulsion to give, right? So you know, it's not like a membership fee or anything. It's just an optional contribution, and you give it give if you believe in it. If you don't believe in it, don't give it. Don't give towards it. So um, I just I don't give. Yeah, say sorry, thing. or I tell them I give for other things, which is true. We give to the church and give to Christian uh, work. All right, so we've covered some interesting questions. Um, let's move forward. Let's see if we can cover some more ground on these uh, uh, social matters. And you know, feel free to bring up these top, uh, additional topics uh, maybe next week when we have some other things. 
So let's move now to uh, another big area on uh, which is divorce. Now, uh, this is a big uh, issue, especially within the church. So we're not talking about outside the church, we're talking about within the church. Now, how do we think about divorce? Or what do we think about divorce? We know that God doesn't approve this. It's very clear. Malachi 2.16, God says, I hate divorce. And we know that uh, marriage was designed by God for a lifetime. Jesus said, whom God has joined together, no, let no man separate. You know, So that's very clear. We, it, two things are very clear. Divorce is not God's design or God's desire. Marriage is meant for a lifetime. And that's very clear. But then, in life, all kinds of things happen. Right? They, things happen. So, there can be moral failure, there could be financial, and so on. And these are, you know, usually, usually, uh, you know, in, 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 in this, you know, just working with people, these are two big uh, causes for divorce. Where I'm talking about, we're talking about from everything now we're saying, we're saying within the context of the church. Where these are two big things, which usually we where we usually see divorce happen. One is unfaithfulness, you know, moral failure. You know, the husband or the wife, somebody in the marriage uh, is unfaithful to their spouse, uh, and that is very painful. It's very hard, and it usually ends up in divorce. Usually, now. There are cases where the the spouse who has been wronged uh, may be able to extend forgiveness and seek restoration, and we have seen that happen. You know, I'm not saying every time there's unfaithfulness, it always ends in divorce. No, in some cases, the spouse forgives uh, and accepts the husband or the wife who has been unfaithful, accepts them back, and they are reconciled, and then they live happily. They, they're able to journey forward. Of course, there's a process of healing that takes place and they go on. But in some cases, not like that. You know, uh, the, when there's unfaithfulness, the other person is so hurt and there is, and also there's no repentance on the other side. So that ends up there in divorce. Uh, the other thing we've seen also is in a case where there is financial problems, meaning, Especially the husband is not taking care of the family, you know, not providing for the house and uh, neglecting the whole family. So then, of course, it, it begins with lots of problems, problems, problems. And then eventually things may come to a point where uh, the marriage ends in a divorce. Other situations are where there's a lot of abuse. Uh, the husband maybe you know ill treating his wife ill treating the children and so on. I'm talking again I'm talking about Christian homes you know in the church and uh, you know the, the 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 wife may be patient maybe enduring it for a season for some time but then at some point it's just so hurtful sometimes even harmful very dangerous uh and especially when there's physical abuse and uh, then that's when you know things deteriorate and divorce happens. So, how must we respond? You know, what 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 is our understanding? We must understand that there are these situations where divorce is permitted in the Bible. Jesus mentioned uh, in Matthew five thirty two, when there is unfaithfulness on the part of either the husband or the wife. In Matthew 5.32, Jesus is specifically talking about a wife, a wife who's been unfaithful to the husband, but it also works the other way. Although it's not stated, it should be applied the other way as well. right? So although in Matthew 5.32, it's, it's, it's one way of reference to a scenario, it should be applied to all related scenarios, where if the husband is unfaithful, the wife has a right to divorce. Um, the other scenario we see is in 1 Corinthians 7.15, when there is an unbelieving spouse 
and, and there is desertion, uh, then the other spouse is left with no choice the, that then to dissolve the marriage. But if it's applicable in that situation, then willful desertion also happens in the case of believers when you know they may start out as believers, but uh, one of them would just disappear. You know, and and think of these cases, and these are real scenarios. There were two two young people, both were believers. Uh, one was from here in Bangalore. One was from another city. They got married, and I found it very strange because within a month, a month and a half later, maximum. There seem to be some problems, very strange problems. I found it very strange because uh, the mother of the, the 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 lady came to me and said, "You know, uh, I, there are problems in the marriage. Please pray." But but neither the husband or the wife what they just they just got married, young couple. None of them came and told me that there's problems, and I was wondering, like, okay. Why is the mother coming in saying all of this? And then, um, like, let's say in about two months, maybe two and a half months, okay, uh, they said, uh, you know, they needed some counseling and they chose to go to the pastor of the church that the, the, the girl was from. And I said, okay, fine, you know, as long as you go and get help from somewhere. So they started one or two sessions and I, again, I found something. I found something very strange, and I did not express anything. But within that week, what had happened was the the wife, and this was unknown to any, anyone. She had gone and applied for a visa to the U.S. and just got got on a flight, disappeared to the U.S. and never to be traced again gone and uh, the you know so basically then the whole the whole story came out that it appeared appeared and again we can't prove this but it appeared in this particular case that the whole intent of that woman wanting to get married or the young lady wanting to get married was for her to go get a visa to go to the US because if you say that you're married and you want to go to the US you are more likely to get a visa she was denied a visa earlier before her marriage but now she used this as a way to say I am coming back I'm just got married whatever and disappeared so it seemed like that was the whole setup so then what do you do in a situation like this can you tell this so this is that there is no unfaithfulness in the sense of there was no adultery or anything committed uh, there was no moral or financial failure but there was this part of a willful desertion where in this particular case, the young lady who had just got married, and this was just within three months of getting married, got on a flight, disappeared into the US. Uh, what, what do you tell this young man? Do you say, hey, you know, God hates divorce, you have to stay like this for the rest of your life? Or do you say, fine, you know, this has happened, it's outside your control. For whatever reason, that person chose to this you know, just abandon the marriage and maybe even use this marriage as a way to get a visa and disappear. And, you know, the girl's parents said, look, we don't know anything. It's, she's an adult, she made her decision, whatever. You can't argue with the parents, they can't do anything. But this actually happened. You know, it, it was such a shock. It was a shock to me also. No one, no one saw this coming, you know. And, uh, well, what do you do? So that marriage was, uh, you know, went, went through a divorce. And then the man, young man got married again and he's happily married. He has his own family, everything's gone, going fine now. Uh, it's been many years, of course. But I'm just giving that as an example where uh, this was between two believers. And it turned out like this in a very strange situation. So, 
while first corinthians 17 specifically addresses willful desertion in the context of a believer and unbeliever uh, you can also apply it here in a context of two believers where somebody just, just abandons the marriage and disappears or just walks out of it you cannot hold the other person responsible for the choice of or the decision of that person so that's one example there have been uh, at, at least i can think of one other similar uh, scenario uh, and even in that case we had to help the the you know uh, the the man journey through the whole divorce and again he got remarried and he's he's fine but that you know that would come under this this whole abandoning of the marriage then there is this whole issue of physical and emotional abuse and it's in that same passage of Malachi 2, 14 to 16, you know, where, well, well God says he hates divorce. In, in Malachi 2, 14 and uh, 16, he, he, he makes it very clear that you don't deal treacherously. Right? You don't deal treacherously. And if you look at the meaning of that word, doing deal treacherously, it just talks about don't do evil undercover. So in English, we say deal treacherously. We say, okay, don't be unfaithful. But the actual Hebrew there is don't do evil under hiding. That means so this hating divorce is given in this in this scenario saying, man, you don't deal evil with your spouse in hiding. Because that's going to end up in divorce, and I don't, and I hate divorce. So there is, God is addressing this whole build-up towards divorce, which is, don't deal treacherously, don't deal, don't treat your spouse with evil. The person, the woman you've married, in your youth, don't treat her evil. You know, don't do evil to her, undercover. That is, you know, behind closed doors. We would put it, would say like that. Because that is actually building up towards divorce, and I hate divorce. So that's how we should correctly understand Malachi 2.14 through 16. But many times we only say, God hates divorce, God hates divorce. And that is true. But he's, 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 he's explaining the whole scenario there, right, of dealing treacherously or don't do evil undercover, because that's, you're, you're doing violence to the, the, the woman you've married. And it's going to end up in divorce, which is something God hates, right? But what if, what if the man is doing evil? That is, he's treating his wife with violence um, in that relationship. Can we just tell the lady, you know, you have to stay there and suffer the violence and suffer the evil and just take it just because God hates divorce? No, that's not the intent there. God is talking to the man saying, don't do it because it's going to end up like this, right? So what I have run into many uh, scenarios is that, especially in this context of abuse, is that when women are suffering abuse, uh, they go to a pastor, and then a pastor says, you know, God hates divorce, you have to stay in the marriage. That is, I believe, wrong counsel because you're telling somebody to stay in a place where there is evil and violence being done against them and they're being dis destroyed gradually, you know, and you're putting their life in danger just because you're saying God hates divorce. And we are misunderstanding Malachi 2, 14 through 16, right? So doesn't God love the woman who's being abused? Doesn't God want her safety, her well-being? Uh, and to you know to move her to a place of safety, and then you know shouldn't wouldn't God treat the woman fairly uh, in love and in goodness? Of course He will. Right. So our counsel should come from that perspective, and not just force somebody to stay in a situation where there's evil, violence, and danger to their lives. Okay. So. We must understand that uh, there will be situations in life where believers are going to 
end up in divorce. It's not the best, but it happens. And what we must understand is that, well, uh, let me put it, I think I wrote it down somewhere here. Um, you know, okay. Uh, yeah. God hates the divorce, but he still loves the people who have gone through it. You know, so we should not look down upon them. So the the divorce might happen, the event might happen for whatever reasons. We've mentioned a few. But we still need to love the people who've gone through it. But somehow in some churches, and I've heard this firsthand from people that the church tends to look down on those who have gone through a divorce or or going through it and you know they treat them as second class citizens. They don't they don't care for them so but you know we should in fact love them we should be there for them and we should extend the heart of god of mercy and compassion to them and give them hope for the future that god can make all things new in their lives let me pause here and let's just take up and you know, give some time for questions and discussion on this um and uh let's see okay any questions on this topic? I know it's a difficult topic, but uh, let's try to do what we can. Pastor, what about the marriages with suspicious partner due to psychiatric problems? If it's difficult to live together, could that be a reason for divorce? Um, yeah, that's a challenging question. Um, so, you know, I... I so... Could a spouse use a psychiatric problem as a reason for divorce? It's a challenging question, you know, because if you compare it to a physical illness, you see what could happen is two people get married and one of them's after marriage faces a physical problem. So a psychiatric problem could, you know, could come up. I mean, for whatever reason, maybe it was undetected before or whatever you know and then it's it becomes a very difficult thing for the the husband or the wife who is married to take care of to become the care caregiver to the spouse personally okay this is my personal thought again it's uh, you know like we don't have a chapter and verse on this but personally i think the right thing to do is for them, for the, the the husband or the wife to 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 still love and to still care as much as possible for the spouse who has been affected by ill health, either physically or mentally. That would be the right thing to do. But sometimes, and again, I've I've seen these situations where. It just becomes unbearable, right? Meaning, the 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 situation is so bad where this the spouse is unable to provide the kind of care that is needed, especially if it if it gets especially the case of a psychiatric illness, right? Where it's it's not you know just a physical condition; it's this very complex situation. It becomes unbearable. And I think in, in, in a situation like that, it's the right thing would be to get outside help. I do, of course, you know, one person cannot provide all the care, so wherever possible, get additional help to provide care. You know, so that would be, I think, the right thing to do. For that to end in a divorce, uh, again, I don't want to be a judge in this matter. Uh, I would say it's it's left entirely to the person, you know, to what their conscience permits them to do. You know, we, we can't give a chapter in verse other than the fact that, you know, God brought man and woman together for life. God brought them together. But then things have gone out of hand. Things are very difficult, unbearable. Um, I would leave that decision to the spouse who is providing care. And 
to their conscience before God, they need to make the decision. And you now we need to just be supportive to both people in this decision. You know, because there, there is a legitimate thing if it's a psychiatric problem and if it's very difficult for, you know, to, to manage, to handle, then we also need to understand the other person's situation. While we cannot come with an answer to the situation, we could say, look, we are going to support both people through the decision that is made. And we're not going to judge because we're not in their shoes. And uh, while we would definitely say, in the, you know, to whatever extent possible, be together. But if it's not practically possible, then we would let the spouse make the decision and support them through it, stand with them through it. And I believe uh, God will understand the decision that's made, the practical practicalities of it. Yeah. So it would vary. The outcome would vary from marriage to marriage, scenario to scenario. I'm not saying everything will end in the divorce, but some do. And uh, we let the spouse make the decision. We don't do it for them. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a that's a difficult question. Yeah. Difficult situation. Any other questions? Okay, so um, so we've covered two areas, uh, kind of both related to marriage. Um, so we will we will have. I think we need one more hour to kind of touch upon the other topics. Uh, I haven't delved in depth into the other topics that I've listed in the notes. Uh, but I think we'll take another hour just to, you know, just share some way of thinking uh, for other topics. So we'll do that next week. Uh, and uh, we should wrap everything up next week. And then uh, I'll just provide you the assessments to work on rest of November as a full revision for this course. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for being on the class today. Can somebody close in prayer? And then we will dismiss. Let's pray. <clears throat> Go ahead. So Lord, this Heavenly is... Father, one thing, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, giving us one more opportunity, Lord, to know more about uh, marriage, Lord. Uh, Lord, I thank you so much for Pastor. Thank you for your wisdom and spirit, Lord, to guide us, Lord. Thank you for helping us to uh, understand some of the uh, difficult questions. And Lord, I do believe the days to come, Lord, we all, those who are Lord, listening and Lord hearing, we could able to be a a good minister to many families, Lord. Lord, once again, I thank you so much for each one of us, Lord. And I pray for all the um, students, those who are married, Lord. I pray and bless their family. And I pray for on the students, those who are going to marry, Lord. Also, I pray and bless them for their future life, Lord. Once again, I thank you so much for Pastor for giving uh, and guiding us, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ravan. Um, have a good break. and. I'll see you all next week. Thanks. Bye now.